Watch out, America. Watch out, Europe. Africa is coming for you. Yes, that's right. The FIFA Women's World Cup is upon us again. And here at the On The Whistle podcast, we cannot wait to see how our women from Nigeria, South Africa, Zambia, and Morocco get on down under in Australia and New Zealand. My name is Alistair Howard, and alongside me today is our women's football editor at large. I am hope I'm getting the title wrong. Football expert, our journalist supremo, Ferdos Munda. Ferdos, you've been covering the Men's Cricket World Cup qualifiers, I believe, for the last month or so. But I'm happy to report that you're sick of that nonsense. You've come back to the right side, to the football side of things. How are you doing today? Yeah, very good. Just come back from a trip to Zimbabwe, where the news football-wise is good. The Zimbabwean FA has been unsuspended from FIFA. Uh, I guess it's not good news for cricket because cricket had become the darling sport of Zimbabwe until, unfortunately, they failed to qualify for the 50-over World Cup. And we were told one of the reasons that cricket was receiving so much support was because football wasn't being played. But Zimbabwe are unbanned. They will take part in the qualifiers for the 2026 World Cup. They've been drawn alongside South Africa, Nigeria, and three other teams. I think Benin is in there as well. So that's good news for them, I guess. Um, not too much buzz around the Women's Football World Cup in Zimbabwe, albeit that really two of their neighbours are going to be playing. South Africa in the south, Zambia in the north. So I was hoping that there'd be a bit more kind of uptake on that. But uh, I think they, they're concerned with an election and with the dollarized prices, which i got to tell you, Zimbabwe has become a very, very expensive place to live. And uh, I think people are, are struggling there. So, yeah, I'm back. I'm happy to be back. And I'm looking forward to the World Cup. How are you guys? Absolutely. I'm, I'm doing, doing really well. I'm really excited for, for the World Cup. And joining us to break down the plethora of storylines and characters of these four countries, four nations heading to the World Cup is Nigeria's Jane Francis Noize and our Zambian sister, Ashley Nakazwe. Thank you both for coming onto the show. How are you both doing today? Well, we're fine. Okay, so I'll start. <laughs> Sorry, Ashley. But I'm fine and I'm happy and I'm looking forward to, yeah, the Women's World Cup coming up in a few um, days. Uh, it's giving us all the fever, you know, the tension, the pressure. But we'll see how it goes. Oh, yeah, I'm all good on my end. Excited because for us, this is historic. This is historic by far. For the very first time, our women's national team gets to go before the men. Like, do you know how big that is for our country? Recently, the the the, the, the sports minister made a sports minister, the president made a joke saying, um, imagine the, 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 the one time Zambia qualifies for the Women's World Cup, the men have now qualified for AFCON. So they needed the lack of the girls. So, yeah. It's exciting for us in Zambia. <laughs> <laughs> the men can only only get the AFCON. That's as far as they can get. The World Cup is too far, far a step, but not for the women. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, guys, thank you so much for joining us. We've got a lot to get into, so we're going to get stuck right in. And we're going to start with our African champions. South Africa are heading to the World Cup. They're in a t really tough group with Sweden, Argentina, and Italy. But obviously, there's been a lot of stuff happening off the pitch in build up to the tournament. Ferdos, do you want to walk us through what has been going on with South Africa? Why am I seeing on the verge of the World Cup that in a pre-tournament friendly, they lost 5-0 to neighbours Botswana? What is going on? Yeah, well, that was quite some result. And that's because they were unable to field a first choice team for that fixture. So Banyana Banyana were in quite a severe dispute with SAFA, the South African Football Association, because they didn't want to play this friendly fixture, first of all, at what they considered a substandard pitch so they wanted to play at one of the bigger stadiums, somewhere like the Cape Town Stadium or Soccer City or even Moses Mabida. They wanted the, the pitch to be in a good condition. And they also wanted better quality opposition. We know that FIFA have given each member nation who's participating at the World Cup a substantial amount of money. And South Africa's team wanted to see that money spent on securing an opposition like Germany, who we know that Zambia have just beaten in that really big upset, you know, maybe a South American team, someone like that. Instead, they were given Botswana, and they poo-pooed that. Botswana ended up beating the B team 5-0, as you say. But that's because the first-choice squad boycotted the match. And really, it was a very stressful week in the South African women's football. There's dispute over pay. There's dispute over whether the team feel they will be properly remunerated for their efforts at the World Cup. And it almost looked like maybe they wouldn't want to go to the World Cup. Desiree Ellis tearfully had to take charge of the B team or the second choice or third choice, whatever you want to call them. And that's because she's an employee of SAFA and SAFA's directive was 
you've got to go on that match, you've got to appear on that pitch, and you've got to coach who we're giving you to coach. So she had to do it. They got absolutely pumped, as you said. And it really looked as though Banyana Banyana would go to the World Cup in tatters. To the rescue came multi-billionaire, millionaire Patrice Matsepe, who's put in the money that Banyana Banyana wanted in order to be satisfied that they'll get the pay that they want, that they, obviously the opposition that they want is now a thing of the past. But they arrived in two groups in New Zealand and they will play the World Cup. I think pay dispute is not uh, common to South Africa only. We've seen it in Nigeria. We've seen it with a few of the South American countries. We've seen it with the Jamaican reggae girls. So this is really, I think it's so problematic because these things kind of erupt on the eve of a World Cup. There are issues that exist throughout football. They, they exist all the time. They exist annually, biannually. And then they only come up really when the World Cup is happening. And it comes to the attention of especially the global north, who are so professional, that players in the global south just don't get paid properly. I mean, we spoke to Janine van Veek a month ago, who expressed that the South African women's national team is not contracted. So everybody is kind of playing on this amateur pay-for-play basis. And it's just not good enough. It's one of the reasons why, according to Janine, we're so far behind and we're not going to win a World Cup. That's not a good note to start on. I think uh, we'd like to see some of our teams get out of the groups. But you can see the challenges that they face and it's challenges that are not being faced in Europe, uh, in North America and and in uh, Australia and New Zealand. World. And I, w- I would say even here in England, there has been, you know, big noises around the Federation. Obviously, the, the new thing at this World Cup is FIFA is actually setting aside money, not just for the federations, but money that's specifically going to go to the players. And, and in England's case and a few other cases, you know, the federations have turned around and said, well, FIFA is giving you money, so we're not going to give you as much money as we, we promised. Um, and obviously a lot of teams have, you know, like England have had those conversations behind closed doors, but teams like South Africa kind of have had to make that step. And I don't know what you guys think, Ashley and Jane Francis, but like, my one of the themes I've seen about this World Cup, particularly, you know, from a global sense, but particularly from an African sense is, you know, we've seen the women's team teams perform really well at the WAFCON. They, you know, it was a real breakout tournament in many ways in terms of the perception of the game. And, you know, you had teams like Morocco and Zambia kind of catching up to Nigeria. But it's also been a, a sense for me that this World Cup has been a time when the players themselves have actually said enough is enough. You know, we're not taking the nonsense of federations we're not taking the nonsense of you know other people trying to jump on board we actually have a lot of our own dignity and we're saying you know we want to be paid fairly we want to be kind of you know trusted and we want to kind of get what we actually deserve as players which we haven't been getting for the last years I don't know what you guys think about that yeah I think I want to take it back a bit to the South African team mainly because for me the thing that really hurt my feelings with Banyana Banyana is because look at this team no Banyana Banyana has been doing very well since the Aisha Buhari uh, since the Aisha Buhari tournament. So look at this cup. Mm-hmm. Look look at yeah, the cup. Look at this team that has been consistent since then. With all the challenges that they've been facing as a country and as a federation, the, the women have shown up. And I remember after the Aisha Buhari, uh, we were now going into the WAFCON qualifiers and um South Africa played, I think it was, if I'm not mistaken, it was Mozambique, if I'm not mistaken. And the, the game was played at, because uh, I was there, it was at the FNB Stadium. We were so excited. The girls are now playing at the FNB Stadium. I'm like, this is like the, the best stadium in South Africa. We were all excited. So when that happened, my thinking personally, I was going to think that even when the World Cup um, build-up was starting, the same energy would be directed to the team. So when the girls came up and they were very, very serious and they stood their ground on what they wanted, it was justifiable. Because look at what they've achieved in the past two years. Knowing fully well that when we were, because I I was in Asia during COVID, when we were during COVID, the last game that was played internationally was a friendly between Zambia and South Africa at the Bidvest Stadium the week before the country was shut down. So after that, there was no activity. And even when things came back to life, the Women's National League took a long time to start. But the girls were consistent. They went on to win the WAFCON with all the the drama that was happening. And then they didn't even have one of their staff players, Gabrielle. Gabriela was not in the WAFCON squad. But they still managed. Um, you know, there were players that were injured during the WAFCON, the WAFCON squad who still 
went on and showed up for their country. Then comes the country that promises them, oh, we'll do this for you, we'll do this for you. Come World Cup, the promises are not showing. So I can only understand what uh, Coach Deja was going through. However, the players were a priority at that point. And even when the second team went on to play, for me, I'm just like, if I was one from the second team, I wouldn't have gone onto the pitch as well because I need to stand for the main team also and be like, girls, let's not all go to the pitch because if we're all going to turn a black eye, let's all do this, turn the black eye because the government needs to take us serious. Banana Banana has been a team that has been consistent and we all need to learn from in terms of our African teams. Playing Botswana, of course, I felt like that was disrespectful. But then again, when Zambia played Tanzania, everyone was like, oh, why is Zambia playing Tanzania? But when they played Tanzania, Tanzania gave us a tough time during the last friendly. Mm. It wasn't an easy it wasn't an easy game. Just because a team looked not good enough because of the tournament you're going to play doesn't mean they won't challenge you. Because this, the test start, started from there, from, from the Zambian team. So regardless of what was going in the South African team, I really give them kudos for standing their ground. And I really hope that it's a lesson, not for FIFA only, but for CAF. In Zambia, I've been deliberately attending the AGM because I want to see where the money goes. If I'm going to report about the Copa Queens, I really need to know what the expenditure looks like. So when we attend the AGM, we're able to see the reconciliation of where the money went that came from uh, FIFA, from the government, and from, from CAF. And luckily now, CAF needs them to reconcile. They now have a reconciliation account. CAF needs, needs them to reconcile the money. So when all this money is being dished out to the girls, what's the plan? I think as much as there's a lot of issues that needs to be done, the main channels, FIFA and CAF, need to take these things very seriously because a player cannot be waiting for money that was dished out to, game, to them already six months, a year later, when it takes a click of the button to have the money transferred. And luckily now, with the FIFA club licensing law, every player has to have a, a, a personal account. So are we really going to make use of these accounts that the players will get their money instantly? Because Zambia is one of the countries that is getting the club licensing. We, we had the workshop just uh, three weeks ago. So let's see how fast it's going to deal with the money that is going to come from, from FIFA when it comes to the girls. Because I think it would be very wrong that after such a tournament where the girls are making their first appearance, the money doesn't come in and then there'll be bad publicity and then fans will be quiet and, and yada, 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 yeah. All right, and, and I think it's also, you know, what breaks my heart more about the South African situation is the fact that the Federation was ready to give the men 250,000 South African rand if they qualified for the World Cup. And we're talking about players who won the AFCON. I mean, who are... It's, it's, the South African situation is almost similar to what's happening in Nigeria. The, the, the women are more successful or have demonstrated more success and they just can't be heard. I, I don't. I don't understand how that happens, really. Yeah, I, I I totally agree. I think South Africa is even more accentuated when yeah the men's team you know couldn't even get to that to the Afcon and yet the women's are are out, are out there winning. I mean, kind of getting away from the kind of all of this build up. You know, you know Ashley, Ashley, you're talking about how they you know went through that Afcon and performed brilliantly even without players like Gabriela Salgado and even you know Tembi Hadlano was injured early on um, and kind of they had to battle through that you know for me looking at this World Cup group you know you have Sweden who South Africa have played a couple times before but obviously are one of the heavy hitters and then Argentina and Italy and you know we know that both Argentina but especially Italy have come on a long way you know they had a really credible Euros even though they, they ended up losing and getting bottom of their group they gave a real good, kind of good effort of it how do we see them kind of coming into this tournament, you know, with the likes of, you know, potentially Tembi Hatlana, she's back, but she hasn't been playing regularly. She's only played in the last couple of months. You know, how important is that first match against Sweden? You know, the arguably the big, the biggest hitters in that group. I think when you think about it, first of all, how has the, 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 the team psychologist dealt with the players' mentality before going into the World Cup, knowing fully well what they just incurred when they were home. Because I feel like their mental state is going to play a very big role in the first match because they didn't play the, 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 the match at home with their fans to boost their confidence. However, they do have a friendly... Uh, is it with Costa Rica prior to the World Cup starting? 
So maybe yeah. that will be one that will be important. But for me, I felt like the one at home should have been the biggest one to send them off. However, they may they they, they will use this one as a as a as a as a as a as a as a, as a, as a dry run for the World Cup. Knowing the the best part about South Africa is that it's not the, it's not going to be the first time. They're no longer the the newbies in the World Cup. They are going there now as a as an experienced team, so they know what to expect. They know what they are playing, who they are playing against, and who they um uh and what their plan is. One thing I like about Coach Desire is that she always studies the opponent. It doesn't matter who South Africa is playing. Coach Desire has time to study the opponent and know their weaknesses and their strengths, and will build her team based on that. And the goodness about the South African team is their unity. They are, they're, they're united. And they will show up on that pitch united. So the first game will be very important. And I know for sure they will show us what Manana Manana is made of. Because the confidence and the, and, and the units that they have is one that cannot be uh, shaken regardless of what is going on in-house. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And when it, when it comes to these teams, I feel like with, with all three of the other teams, when you see who who is the most important person in this team, you know, obviously, I think there's obvious answers for for Morocco, for Zambia, for Nigeria. But for me, the obvious answer for South Africa is is Desiree Ellis. You know, I think she's shown, you know, even since 2018 in that, in that AFCON when they got to the final and, and lost on penalties. Yeah, that she has the kind of intelligence, that she has the kind of leadership capacity. And, and you know, like you said, she's incredibly kind of able to to maneuver in different situations. You know, especially we think about that that AFCON final, you know, that was, you know, one of the difficult, most difficult environments to win away from home, you know, when you've got 50, 50 plus thousand Moroccans kind of baying for blood, whistling every single touch, and yet she was able to manage that so, so well. Um, and I think, like you said, she's now got that experience. Yes, the team has the experience of being at the World Cup, but she also has that experience of actually, she's the one who can kind of manage this team in, in a group that, you know, I think is, is difficult, but I think is actually one of the groups where, where an African team has real chance of getting out. Cause I think, you know, Sweden will be tough, but I think against Argentina, Italy, I think South Africa definitely have enough to get past them, but let's kind of move on. Now we, we've talked a lot about the chaos and the, and the drama ahead of the world cup. One of the teams, probably the only one that has avoided most of that is, is our fellow AFCON finalists, Morocco. Um, who are kind of coming into this World Cup as as alongside Ashley Zambia as newbies as debutants? They have never done this before. They've never been to a World Cup. You know, the Afcon was their first Afcon they had been to in in what 22 years, and and they made this miracle run to the final. Obviously, Jane Francis probably doesn't want to talk about that too much after what happened in the semi final against Nigeria, losing uh, kind of when Morocco beat them on penalties. But, you know, I wanted to come to you for those because I know you wanted to talk about this because the significance of Morocco qualifying for this World Cup is so much bigger than just, you know, a team, a country qualifying for the World Cup. But the fact that they're the first Arab country, the first North African country, I think the first Muslim majority country as well to qualify for the World Cup. You know, how significant is that in the kind of greater scheme of things that, you know, in, in terms of sport? Yeah, definitely. It's huge. And I think just if you put it in a global context, you know, what we're seeing somewhere like Afghanistan, for example, where women are not permitted to be part of any sphere of public life. And that is, as you know, a Muslim majority country, which is now under the rule of the Taliban. And we're just seeing that women not only are, can't they play sport, you know, they can't even take jobs in public service, uh, teaching college has been shut down, that kind of thing. And it's very important that that narrative is challenged and that there are living examples of where women who live in Muslim majority countries who are of the faith and practicing and, and proud to say so are still showing up in terms of national sport, uh, in terms of, of being figureheads and role models for, for time to come. And I think Morocco is really going to change the game in that regard. There's a player in their team Nohelia Benzina, who's going to wear the hijab when she takes the field. And we know that FIFA had previously banned it. They cited a safety concern for women covering their hair, which you know, in itself is a little bit strange. I suppose if there's a tug, maybe there's some kind of issue there. But now you know, she's able to do that. And that will send a message to a lot of women who grow up in Muslim countries from Muslim backgrounds that, hang on, just because your dress code or you want to adhere to this dress code is a certain way, doesn't mean that you can't play sport. There is definitely a way to do it. So I think that's going to be a big symbol. I saw an article uh, about this young five-year-old girl who had gone to watch the Atlas Lionesses play in a warm-up game. 
and, and was just so inspired by it. She told her mom that she was so thrilled to be able to see this. That's what we need, because if you can't see it, as we say, then, then you can't be it. And I speak as someone who grew up in a not very conservative, but grew up in a Muslim home where this just wasn't available to us. You know, when, when I went to school in the, in the 90s, it was like you know, the girls would engage in like drama and theater and public speaking and like some embroidery and stuff like that. We weren't really encouraged to go and play sport. Uh, we weren't encouraged to be very competitive and to even aspire to playing sport at an elite level. And now I really see that changing. And, and Morocco are not the only one. I mean, Tunisia's Ons Jabour is going to play her second Wimbledon final this weekend. She's played the US Open final as well. And I'm so hoping that she goes on to win one of these because here's another example of a woman who still lives in Tunisia, who adheres to many aspects of the of the culture that we know and who's out there playing elite level competitive sport and is, is dominating. And I think the message Morocco are going to send, not just to Africa, because I think they play such an interesting intersectional role in that they pioneers for Africa, they spearheads for Africa, but they're doing the same thing for the Arab world. And the message they're going to send to women in Iran, Iraq, the Middle East, um, you know, th that type of, of, of society is that we can do it and we can stand up and we can be counted. And, and I hope that they go very far and that they make a really big statement at this World Cup because it, it's beyond them. It's about a whole section of society. And I find that so important and inspiring. I think as you've been speaking, yeah, sorry, I think as you've been speaking, I was getting goosebumps because you remember the Morocco atmosphere. This is a country where women are very modest. It's very reserved. And, you know, when you come from countries like South Africa, you know, yeah. we are like very chilled. We like, you know, we do whatever we want in, uh, in SA. Then you go to a country where it's modest, but they showed up to the stadium. It was massive. It's crazy. So now look at these girls from Casablanca or wherever it is that they are, looking at people who are just slightly older than them, doing something, one, in their country, and they're now going to play at the World Cup. Like, that can be, that can be, that can be made up. That's a success story on its own because these girls are being inspired. And for, for a country whereby we, we never, I mean, I don't know, maybe I'm going to speak for myself. We never really look at Arabs as people who want to go and play and get dirty. But the Moroccan women team showed up, same as the men did when it was the yeah. the, 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 the the World Cup. At the end of the day, we need to give them credit. I mean, Morocco invested a lot of money in, them, in their sports uh, center, which is showing the results. And I wouldn't be shocked if the women do exactly what the men did, because they have prepared. And the girls, the Arab girls, whichever part of the world they are, whether it's the Middle East or Northern Africa, they know and they will be excited and proud of what they will do. And for me, it's, 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 it's a big deal. I think the day Morocco plays, we all just have to like, just be there and support them because obviously there will be a lot of controversy. I mean, most of us are Christians, so there will be a lot of controversy and we need to support the girl child who wears the hijab. All right. So, um, <clears throat> alas, they, uh, we're in Morocco together and, I'm sure you already remember my thoughts about the Moroccan team. The fact that the FA, you know, when when we talk about um, being deliberate about the women's football, they have been one FA, at least in Africa, that have shown that consistent, you know, support for the team. Look at the squad going to the World Cup. I think about seven of the players are from AS4. And remember also that the Moroccan team, uh, the Moroccan Federation, you know, have this plan where they pay a percentage of the salaries of the players in the league. And players like uh, Chebek, Chebek uh, players like Fat uh, Fatima uh, Tagnot have been around for a couple of years. The fact that they've not left the league is not because they're not good enough. But I think the Federation wants to keep them back in Morocco because they want to build the team where they get to see the players and, you know, have them play what they believe is the Moroccan brand of football. So there's just going to be a consistent structure. I can have the likes of uh, Nairin coming from Lille, but then I know the main structure of the team are in Morocco. I'm seeing, I'm overseeing the technical development of this player. So it gets to tell you that each day I look at Morocco, I'm like, but why can't other federations catch up? I mean, it's 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 almost it's always not about the money. It's also about putting down the structure. Like 
the technical support. Guys, there's a support UEFA gives to women's football. I think it's about $50,000 to do a development program. Most federations in Africa, Nigeria is not exploiting it. I'm talking about co train the coaches, you know, because you say, you tell them, I, I don't think they give cash, but you say, I want to do this. So they'll say, okay, we'll provide the technical support. So they're flying in coaches or trainers and all that. So why don't you say, I want to train my grassroots coaches, you know, the coaches who will be taking on six to 10 year old players for me. Why can't we do that in Africa so that you can have academy and there's real modern football knowledge being impacted in these kids. And we're looking at in the next 10 years, these are kind of football players from Nigeria will be playing. Why are we not doing it? Why does everybody just want to wait for FIFA grants and then we disperse it the way we want and move on and keep shouting there's no money? It's it's crazy. It's like there's a lot to be done and it can be done, but we're just not ready to do it. And I don't know why. Yeah, I think for me that the sense of this Moroccan team is, you know, bear in mind, I, I, I interviewed the former women's head coach, Karim Ben Sharifa, who was in, in charge before Pedros. And he was saying that when he came in in 2016 uh, or the beginning of 2017, that Morocco had not played competitively for over a year. You know, they went from, a, you know, and so this is a journey from seven years from not playing a single game to being at the World Cup, playing against, you know, Germany, the, the most decorated European team on the continent. And so for me, I think, for me, it's almost Morocco is a bit of a free hit. You know, they, they this is their, their first chance. You know, it's South Africa and Nigeria, the ones with the pressure on them. Whereas I think for Morocco, we're seeing the future is bright. They have the infrastructure, they have the investment. And almost, yeah, they can go out and kind of play against Germany and, and kind of try their best to, to kind of get a good result and see where they go from there. I mean, obviously... With Pedros, they have an incredibly kind of uh, prodigious manager. Obviously, he's won, I think, two or three uh, UEFA Champions League titles with Lyon. Um, obviously, kind of the most dominant side in, in club football in the world. But And I think they're, they, for me, the biggest question is, do they have goals in them? Because I know they're a well-coached team, well-drilled, but they they lack that kind of goal threat. You know, then, And we've seen that in their last couple kind of pre-tournament pre warm-ups. They got two nil-nil draws with Italy and Switzerland. Good results, kind of really good showing in terms of clean sheet but i think that's for me the biggest question is whether they can get have someone who can can put those goals away but now we'll move on to a team that has that player who can put the goals away because like you mentioned james francis there is no one i think in world football that inspires me when i watch them playing and i, I just i don't even know how you begin to defend in barbara banda and this zambian team in terms of i love watching them because it is just it's almost just pure chaos you know that that they're struggling defensively, that they're not the most organized team, but you almost don't have to be when, like you said, you have the cheat code of her, but not, not only her, you know, and Ashley will call on to you in a second. You have unbelievable ta talent up front, you know, Mapepa, you have Grace Chanda, you have Banda, you have Kunandanji, who's obviously outscored Asisa Oshwala in Spain. You know, this is a team just full, full of attacking talent. And, you know, Ashley, you've just beaten the European finalists in Germany, 3-2 in that thrilling game, was it the 90 plus 12 minute final goal from Banda? And what a goal it is. If you haven't looked it up, please go look at it. Go watch the highlights of that game because it was an amazing winner by Barbara Banda. Ashley, how are you feeling as the other debutante coming into the World Cup? I am, I'm getting emotional as you speak. I'm literally getting emotional because for me, I think that's why I don't like to cover the Zambian game. I can't. Even at the WAFCON, I can't cover the Copa Queens. I'd rather sit in the stands than go and sit on the... I'm a photographer. I don't want to sit on the pitch because I might run on the pitch and go and hug a player. I don't trust myself yet like that. You know, the team makes me so... It's not like this is... The team makes me so proud. So we can take it back to the WAF court, first of all. For me, I feel like it was actually a blessing in disguise that Barbara did not play. Because who would have not seen Grace Chenda and Irene Lungu shine? because Kunda Nanji and Barbara could have taken over. And I feel like them not being present at the WAFCON prepared the team to stand without the star players. So our team is solid enough to withstand anything. So even with the Hazel and the news, I'm like, they dealt with it. They dealt with, they dealt with, they dealt with it at WAFCON. The Hazel and the news has broken us, but the, the team is ready because the WAFCON was the worst blow not having Barbara Banda, but the team showed up.
So that was a blessing in disguise. So now looking at where we are now, me, I'm like, this is girl child, it's possible. This is our moment now. Barbara Banda is going to go there and show everyone that didn't think she would make it to the World Cup what she's made of because they've prepared. And even when they went to uh, play during the international camp, a lot of people had things to say. Why are we taking them outside? Why are they playing teams like Netherlands? Uh, why, why aren't they just staying home? Why are we wasting money doing all of these things? But Faz had a plan. The first game against Netherlands was not very good. Then there was Ireland. Then there was Germany. Like you, see, you could see that the confidence was being built as the as, as the as the games were being played. So even with the German game, regardless of how it ended up, uh, how the the game finished, we knew at the end of the day the Copa Queens are ready now, because from the first international friendly. There were so many mistakes. We were all complaining on Twitter saying there's a lot of team uh, team management problems, game time problems, defense problems. But they had a plan and look at where they are now. So beating Germany, hello, Copa Queens are not even like 50 on the international um, uh, Coca-Cola rankings. There we are beating a team that is second. Who would have thought? So going into the World Cup, I don't think they need any other confidence booster. But they're already high on the sugar, the coke. They're already high on the sugar. That's enough uh, for them to go and play and show up and show the world what they are made of. Regardless of how this World Cup ends up, the fact that they've gone there, they deserve they deserve to be there. And secondly, I know the, people, uh, the players like Ivorin Katogo, who is so young, but made a significant um uh, played a significant role during the the Wafcon, you know. Players like uh, um, the, the our our why am I forgetting her name? Because I'm too excited. Uh, where were Belemu? <laughs> Belemu. <laughs> yes, Belemu. Yeah, Belemu. Belemu. Uh -huh. yeah. Belemu. Yeah, 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 you know, pl players like yeah. Belemu. Uh, there's a there's a there's a game that she had missed out during uh one of the FIFA breaks. It was very significant that she was not there. So now the fact that she's going to be there, we are, we are so excited. You know, my paper, there's so many of them that I can mention. The team is ready. Each and every position has the right um, player and they know what they need to do. And for me, when, we were, when, we were, when they were training to play Tanzania, one thing that Barbara Banda would always tell the, the team, call the name of the player passing the ball to. Let her know the boy is coming. She was showing her, her team leader skills, knowing that she needs her team to be alert. Because if you don't call who the, you don't call the player's name, how will she know the boy is coming to her? So she's preparing her team mentally to go and play physically and with their all when they represent Zambia. This is a big deal for us. The entire country, including the president, is in the anthem. The, 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 the new song that came out, the president is in the video. The entire country is supporting the girls. And I, I think that's incredibly inspiring. And like you said, Ashley, you know, that's what I thought was really impressive about the WAFCON was the way, you know, both, I think, from Barbara Banda's standpoint, because she's shown not only is she one of the best strikers in world football, but the amount of leadership she had, you know, to, to, despite having that incredible blow to not play in the AFCON, to then say, you know what? I could go back to China, I could go back to Zambia, I could step away, but I'm going to stay with this team and I'm going to lead them and I'm still going to be their captain. I'm still going to, I think that was incredible to see that leadership from her, the way she supported the team. And yeah, then kind of hearing stuff you're saying about, you know, even though she's only what, 23, she's the one taking charge at training, saying kind of, this is what we got to do. This is how we play. I think that is, that is really inspiring. Somehow I feel like the military background disciplines the Zambian players. Because a number of our players come from the military. So, you know, you cannot be part of the army and not be a disciplined person, just as a human being. So imagine mm. the discipline that comes from being in the army and putting it on the pitch. That's a double skill. So Barbara Banda's leadership yeah, skills yeah. stems from her personal character as someone who is in the army. So even her leading the team, she does it effortlessly because she knows her country is depending on her and rallying on her. And that is why even with her absence at WAFCON, her presence played a role. Just her being on in the in the stands watching her team, the team knew, hey, our, 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 our captain is watching us. We need to do this for Barbara Banda because the news was crazy. I mean, when we're in Morocco, 
the news was crazy. Everyone was wondering why is why is Barbara Banda playing? There was negative publicity left, right, and center in the country. The blogs were, were having a feast day. However, <laughs> I still feel the blessing in this in disguise that Grace Chanda was was seen at the Wafcon. Hazel Nali was seen at the Wafcon. Uh, the Ivarin Katongo was seen. It needed to be done, preparing them for the World Cup. So now they know their names. Everybody's looking out to see Ivarin. They're not just waiting to see Barbara Banda. They're waiting to see the Copper Queens. Barbara Banda. Yes, the Copper Queens. They're waiting for the Copper Queens. Not one player, but the Copper Queens led by Barbara Banda. 100%. And I love that narrative of kind of the Olympics was all about Barbara Banda. The AFCOM was all about everyone else. And now it's kind of bringing everything together. I mean, they're in, a, again, a really, really tough group. Obviously, it's it's them, Japan, you know, Japan, one of the best teams in the world consistently over the last decades, you know, one of the few teams that have consistently challenged the US. And then Costa Rica and Spain. Now, th this is where I think it gets interesting because, you know, Spain on paper, full strength Spain squad, one of the best in the world. I think, you know, especially backed by that Barcelona team that provides the core but this is not that Spain team, right? Because we have so many Spanish players. You know, again, we've spoken a lot about issues with the Federation. They're a team that have gone even further and a lot of the players have boycotted the tournament. Ashley, I don't want to put you too much on the spot, but I will. You know, how confident are you that, that actually Zambia can not just be debutants, but they can get out of this really tough group? Um, during one of the trainings prior to them leaving Zambia, the media had asked, one of the journalists had asked specifically Kunda Nanji, how ready is she to play Spain? Because she plays in the Spanish league and she's going to be playing with some of the yeah. people that she plays with, you know? And one of the things that I loved how Kundanaji responded and said, it doesn't matter how cool we are during uh, the league games. It doesn't matter how much you think you know a person. When it comes to representing your country, you go there as a different beast. And for me, mm. I'm going to have to show up for my country. I may know how they play, but they don't know how I play when I'm playing for my flag. So for me, I feel like Zambia is not just going there to show up and say, oh, hey, we arrived, we made it. They will go and show the Spanish that we know what we're doing. They will, they will show Costa Rica and they will show Japan because they know that each and every game that they've played during the international friendlies has been a World Cup final for them. And Barbara d jokingly did say, I'm going to come back. I'm, I'm going to win the World Cup, which is possible. It may sound like a joke, but you never know what the food gods are saying, you know. At the end of the day, Zambia is prepared, and I know they will show up. Whether or not they win or lose during their group, group games, they will put in their all, and they will still give their opponents a tough time for any of their teams to win against them. It won't be a walkover, because now they know if they could beat Germany, hello? The rest can just follow. Obviously, we're, we're super excited for Zambia. I think they come in with so much energy as Ashley is kind of, we can see even from Ashley has that energy and that passion, but it obviously hasn't all been kind of good news coming out of the camp. Obviously, there was a report in The, the Guardian uh, that has alleged that uh, head coach Bruce Mafe has been uh, under investigation for allegations of me uh, sexual misconduct. Um, and the Zambian, the FAZ, the Zambian Federation has referred that on to FIFA to undergo an investigation of both Mwafe and kind of under-17 coach Kaluba Kangwa. Um, but, you know, obviously we, we hope from our perspective that, you know, whatever is going on behind the scenes in, in the federation and the team, that that will come to light if there has been abuses. Obviously, you know, like we said earlier in the podcast, this has been a, a terrific opportunity at the World Cup where a lot of these teams who, you know, there might be, you know, no, abuses might be a strong word in some cases, like players not being paid and kind of not being treated properly. But it's been a time where players have been able to actually stand up and expose a lot of the kind of issues that are going on behind the scenes. Whereas previously, I think, and when the World Cup isn't there, kind of they don't have the light, they don't have the spotlight on them to say, look, these are the things that are going on that aren't going well. And so I think it's really important, you know, from our perspective, we've seen and I don't know what you guys think, but there is a lot of negative press. And, and again, we, we witness this all the time. And, you know, even you're saying, actually, the reporting around Barbara Banda and stuff around the AFCON is it always feels like when the world press comes to look at, you know, African football, African women's football in particular, is always negative. It's always kind of saying this is what's wrong. And there is this narrative that it's our issue, not Europe's issue, not, you know. But I think 
what I've been really encouraged about this World Cup is actually the players have been so empowered, you know, the capacity to say, actually, we're not going to take this. We have the strength. We have the courage to say we're not going to be bullied. We're not going to let this and this happen. I don't know what you guys think in terms of that and, and players' capacity to speak up and empower themselves. I think it's great. I think it's big. I may not be, you know, a huge fan of Infantino, but I think FIFA took the first step. FIFA empowered this women by, you know, not playing the camaraderie thing with the federations and say, you know, just tell them within the room, we we are guaranteeing players $30,000. I think it was brave of FIFA to have come out to say it openly that every player is entitled to 30000 And I think that, you know, brought about this... Um, um, this boldness we're seeing because um, we keep having situations like this. First, it was U.S. women. They did their thing in isolation. Ada Hebe, um, Ada Hegebeg um, was, uh, you know, had issues with the Norwegian FA and she stayed away for a couple of years. And, you know, it was just her. Speaking for all the other people, uh, the, the, the rest of the team moved on, came for the 2019 World Cup she she didn't come so uh but now knowing like um i think it was yesterday i was talking on the show and i said you know nigeria have partners in in misery so knowing that i'm asking for this thing and i'm not the only you know i'm not the only one it kind of gives that you know team spirit it's like everyone is paying attention it's like the 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 issue would be solved you know all at once that's why I would feel really sad if the Nigerian women wake up tomorrow to say, you know, we're asking for this because this is an opportunity. Everyone is grabbing it. Grab it now. So if you continue, if you consistently say, there's no problem, there's no problem. When you come out to now make those demands, it's going to look really ridiculous. So everyone is speaking now. England is speaking. Canada is speaking. South Africa spoke. They got an intervention. If you're going to have issues subsequently, you know, beyond the 30000 and the match bonus, the daily camp bonus where the Federation is giving, please do it now so that we can all, you know, join and say, yes, they deserve it. Yes, please do it. Uh, I mean, for Nigeria, I'm not expecting the Federation to say we will do it, but maybe just like South Africa, one, you know, private guy is going to say, okay, um, we will pay them, you know, the match the match bonuses and all that. So, but I think it's it's a great thing and, if they can continue like this, not just one person, one lone voice speaking in isolation and then the media um, 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 supporting, let them be there, you know, saying no together, we won't take this. It, it's going to get us a, a lot more results. Like we can see it's getting. I think, I think before we, I think before we even go, um, using the World Cup with with the news that's happening in Zambia, I think at the end of the day for us is just to stick to the 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 thing that is right. The girl child comes first, gender equality comes first, you know, tackling things that do not make women uncomfortable comes first. So regardless of where the investigation goes for in my country, I just hope that the priority goes to the girl child and none of them are made any uncomfortable by and without any intimidation by anyone equal rights protecting the girl child first and the campaigns around the world cup do prioritize uh certain issues like this you know so i just hope that each and every federation out there learns from this and just doesn't use the campaigns that are, that are, are echoed during the world cup whether it's equality or whatever it is that is um uh, being advocated for because i know there will be campaigns this year whatever it is that is being advocated for does not just remain when the tournament is done it should go and live on with the federations and it becomes a norm for each and every country doesn't matter what the culture or uh the uh, human rights apply to the girl child as well okay so um it's true also because i i, I feel like we played you know over this discussion about um, the, the issue with the Zambian um, um, head coach. Um, so I'm not going to just zero on him, but actually also I have a little problem when people talk, you know, are very specifically about the girl child, because I also think that the boy child goes through a whole lot of things. So I just more like, you know, the children, let's look out for them. So both men and women, whoever is going through something needs support, needs to be rescued. 
But then I also feel like we play we uh, we play kind of lip service to these issues when they come up. You know, um, for example, how FIFA treats um, racism is like, OK, we're trying to do something. But at the end of the day, it's like do something it's not we're trying to do something i mean don't come and tell us um so what do you think will be the right punishment i mean it's like so recently in nigeria i think this year a coach died you know one of the coaches of the uh, former coaches of the super falcons and so people were like oh very sad oh, he has done this or you know we we, we oh, um we hope for the best for the family and someone comes out to say that um there is a player or there is a former Super Falcons player who wouldn't be so sad, you know, that this coach died. So that brings me to what I actually want to talk about. So apparently we've had issues where there are allegations that players, you know, are being asked for something in return to make the national team. So even when you're selected and you're in the team, um, it could go. I mean, of course, right now, so it could go for both genders, actually. So the women are asking um, even the female players, the men are asking the female players. I've not heard this kind of issue about the the men's team. Maybe basically because um, 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 homosexual is not something very common in Nigeria, and most of the staff in the men team are actually men. So it's like if you're gay, you're going to have to be gay inside your house. You don't even want anyone to hear, and there are no female, you know, bosses around to so they're a bit safe but then when it comes to the female players so they have to you know face the um the uh, maybe lesbians uh, bosses and of course the coaches who are straight and want to take advantage of you know um their innocence and maybe their vulnerability so and then you hear a journalist of maybe over 20 years experience over 20 years experience with the general Nigerian football telling you that there was a time he took on the battle because the players kept on telling him and he couldn't, you know, he couldn't just keep quiet. So he went to the Federation to say like, really, this is going on. Can't you do something? And then actually you hear things like, well, the Federation said they know, but then there's a boss who tries to cover it up because it's going to be embarrassing to the Federation if it comes out. So you can't even sack the coach immediately because if you sack him, everybody will know it's because of that story that came out. So he stays on. The girl can't be part of the team. There's no justice for her. And we're trying to cover up for the Federation. So it's it's a bit crazy. It's it's like, I mean, it's like empowering evil. It's like, we don't even see it as an issue. Yeah, we don't even see that someone is being hurt out there um, it's not about a career now. It's about the person's, you know, um, mental health. It's like this man can do this and get away with it and nothing would happen. So all the other players know if she's bold enough to, you know, if, if the conversation ever gets out. So she's going to say, uh, please just, you know, do what you can or just stay out because nothing is going to happen because consistently nothing has happened. So now we don't even know the coaches who are involved in these things. You just know that at, uh, there are coaches that are involved. But whether justice was served, whether they were punished, whether you know the law, all those things don't happen. So it's 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 something we should actually, I don't know, maybe look for a way to ensure that it stops. Hundred percent. And and I think that kind of like you were saying, Ashley, this the responsibility of all of us after the World Cup to keep following up on these things, to keep putting pressure on people to make the right decisions, to keep kind of exposing injustice and trying to find justice for those who have been kind of at the heart of these. And like you said, at the end of the day, it's, it's the, you know, it's the players, it's the women, it's the girls, it's the boys, they're the ones who are the ones suffering. And, you know, it's easy to get a headline or whatever, but, you know, we all have to make sure we're doing the work, you know, not just at the World Cup year, but every year to put pressure on those who are causing these kind of abuses or injustices and kind of give the support to those who need it and ultimately remember that they're human beings at the, at the you know, end of the day. These aren't just stories. They're not words. These are actual people being being involved. But I mean, you know, Jane Francis, you're talking about the, the Nigerian Federation and we still have to talk about Nigeria on this podcast. And one of the people who was very keen to talk about the Nigerian Federation was the Nigeria's head coach, Randy Waldrum, on this very podcast. He came on last week to speak about it and he did not hold back. 
He made a lot of a allegations and accusations about the way he and his players have been treated in uh, by the Nigerian Football Federation. Please go back and have a look at that full podcast because there was a lot in there. But to briefly, you know, recap, he said that he at one point hadn't been paid 14 months wages um, heading into the World Cup and uh, that he, a couple of players had been kicked out of the team for complaining about the, the Federation. Um, that he was denied bringing his assistant coach, Lauren Gregg, to the World Cup in retaliation for him not selecting a player that the Federation wanted, uh, among a few other allegations. So please go and have a listen to that. I mean, James Francis, you know, this is not the way we want to be preparing for a World Cup from a Nigerian perspective. You know, do you have a sense for how, you know, both his comments, but then also, you know, the rumors that the players have even discussed boycotting the first match because of their own issues about being paid, you know, how has that impacted the kind of the preparations for, for the World Cup, for the Super Falcons? Okay, so um, I think it's it's very sad, but I, I know Randy, we saw Randy at the AFCON and I can say that he has probably been very patient with the Federation and maybe saying, okay, let's see how these things go. Maybe something dialogue can, you know, uh, do. But um, right now we don't know where it fell out because remember that you have about four players. The players were coming from the United States that since the um, 2022 African have not been paid. You know, every other players have been paid and they're still being owed um, at its sand. And I know that there are a lot of bottlenecks, you know, in these things. Maybe they would say when the paper passed through the ministry, they didn't submit an account for the payment to be made and all that and all that. But I don't think that if you really want to pay someone that's after three months, you know, of consistently writing to the ministry to say, you know, this players they played, I mean, it would be paid. So whatever it's stopping that payment um, would just be somebody's bottleneck or thinking that it's not important. After all, they're in the US and they don't need it. You can't tell us that they're using it to survive their family and all that. So, so these are some of the issues that when you look at, you would know that, I mean, he has been really very patient. And if he doesn't speak out, the players are going to be like, I mean, do you really want to protect this piece so much that you're going to, you know, watch us being treated this way? Because right now, it looks like they're being treated like second-class citizens because every other player in the team, 22 players, 23 players, and about um, um 19, right? I've been paid and you're not paid. So it looks like what's going on, what's happening. And then also you, um, Ashley's talking about, you know, the Zambia team training, this, this, that, that. And they play the, the send off match against the Zania. They get to talk with the players. We had a send for party. That's all we had. We didn't get to see the team, you know, look like we're getting ready for the World Cup. And it's sad. The Federation in their defense said that the players, you know, are are um are in the league and they couldn't come back early enough for them to start. But the players are playing in the same league that South African players are playing, Zambia players are playing. They got to be in camp before traveling for the World Cup camping. Why is our case different? So it looks like truly, if you wanted a camp, you would have done a camp. Either for because you also have to, you know, these things it's not just about the players coming together. You also have to, you know, think because these are the issues we talk about when we say when you go to sponsors and there are no discussions about women football because there's no there's not enough coverage. So not many people, trust me, will be making the trip from Nigeria to cover that World Cup. So the best of the clips they could have gotten is from the team training in Nigeria. And we don't even have that. So it's like we're not intentional about these things. We're not thinking we have to put the Falcons in the face of the media at least. But it's like all those things are not necessary. I mean, they're not important. No one is thinking about them. No one is. And it's sad. You know, it's sad to know that this is nine time champions of Africa. This is a team that are not making a debut but they are going to the World Cup for the ninth time. And this is how we treat them. 
So when you think about all this, it's 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 really, you know, you can understand where the coach is coming from, granting that interview, you know, not holding any bar, throwing it all out there. And that just like a, a guilty child, the Federation just bantered back. Because if you think that the coach is wrong, you would sack him. The fact that they're not sacking him says that they agree. But like a grumbling child, they just bantered back on social media, not even on not even on an official medium. So it's it's uh it's a, a terrible situation. The things I ask myself is so how how do they coexist in camp? Because you have people from the Federation in camp, and then you have the coach, you have the players. So what's the atmosphere like? It's it's going to be very funny and crazy. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think that's the frustrating thing is it's is often you know we the re, you know we ask ourselves why is this all happening right before the World Cup and right when we need our team to be playing the best. But that's precisely the reason, isn't it? Is it's the one time when players can make these noises or coaches in Randy Waldrum's case and say, look. There's, the issues are here, but I mean, looking, you know, Nigeria's problems, I feel like are compounded by not, not only the fact that the preparation hasn't been brilliant, but also, you know, Nigeria in the group of death in this World Cup, I don't think there's a more difficult group in, in the whole tournament. You know, first up, you have Canada, Olympic champions, one of the best in the world looking to get that crown. And then you're playing hosts, Australia, led by, you know, Sam Kerr and kind of terrific team with with some excellent players and playing in front of a home crowd and then even you know debutants republic of ireland we saw them beat zambia they're a solid team you know there's not going to be an easy game and particularly for that first game against canada you're also missing two of your best players obviously the the suspensions of rashida ajibade and halimundo halimundo um, halimatu has carried on from the wafcon so you're missing two of your most important midfielders as well you know how are you feeling going into this this tournament and to, you know how well do you think the super falcons can do well um i think it's not going to be an easy tournament for the super falcons um i think it's going to be you know um uh, one of the um you know um tough games because coming out of all of this and then having like a rebirth of the team because like you rightly said we're going to be having a completely new midfield from what we had in 2019 um, so you don't have Ngozi Okobi at all in the tournament. You don't have Rita, um, you know, at all, um, Chikwelo at all in the tournament. These were the people who started uh, in the midfield in 2019. And of course, also, um, um, also Halimatu Ayinde, who is injured and is not going to be playing that first game. But I think they would, they're going, you know, somehow he's going to find a way. Christy Uchibe um, is one utility player. We watched her during the WAFCON and she demonstrated, you know, all that. And yes, I, I can, I can, uh, I mean, I can be that big player to rise up and take, you know, the, 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 the occasion. And then with the issue of Ngozi Kobe and Coach Randy Waldrum, so we can see that the coach have consistently demonstrated more confidence in Jennifer Chegini than in Ngozi Kobe, and for some reason you may understand, you know, all that. So Echegini is younger, she's more amenable, and um, she's more consistent. In two games, she has gotten herself two goals and one assist, or I think one goal and two assists. So, 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 um, you can understand, you know, why he would probably want to move on with a Kobe and say, okay, let's face this person. So, if I'm gonna make um tough choices on, oh, okay, two important players, what am I gonna drop? Well, it's easier for me to drop a Kobe. So sad not to see her. And then we have also a certain Deborah, uh, you know, in the team, Deborah Ajib uh, Ajibola. So she's another option in the midfield for the team. And, um, and so now if you're going to be thinking about um, Rashida Ajibadi not being available, we saw Payne, you know, Tony Payne <laughs> go around the, the various wings um, positions during the Wafcon. So I think we can deploy that. It's not going to be the best, you know, option, but that first game is going to be a, a makeshift team because like um, we all know Asisat mm -hmm. is returning, but how fit is she? It's not so certain, especially for that first game. So we would definitely have to play, you know, the squad we played during the AFCON where the, the, the team can be built, can't yeah, 100%. be built, I think, be you built know, around to Zambia and, and Barbara Banda, Asisat is such a 
you know, that talisman, that kind of the head of everything. And, you know, one of the reasons why I think Nigeria did struggle with AFCON was her, you know, that her, get, you know, getting injured in that first game against South Africa. Well, thank you so much, Jane Francis. Ashley and Ferdosa both already actually had to drop off. They've had to, to run away to, to get to other things. But thank you so much. And thank you so much for listening and watching along. If you want to follow along on the whistles, we continue to cover the Women's World Cup. As I said earlier, we've got some big interviews still to come out. Uh, with the likes of Desiree Ellis and one or two others. Follow us along at OTW underscore podcast on Twitter and Instagram. And you can look, find us on YouTube as well, uh, as well as on Facebook and, and on Spotify or anywhere you get your podcast. If you're listening and not watching, you can just search on the Whistle Podcast.